Uh, I don't think we have further uh, people coming. Okay, so let's get started and and let me introduce Yanan to you first. Okay, okay. So uh, Doctor Yanan Zheng currently works as a postdoc in the Department of Computer Science of Tsinghua University. In 2020, she obtained a PhD degree from the School of Software, Tsinghua University. Prior to that, in 2015, she received a bachelor's degree from Xi'an Jiao Tong University. Yanan is a former research intern at Microsoft Research Asia. She received a Google China Anibor, uh, Anita Borg scholarship. Her research interests mainly focus on natural language-based intelligence, which includes deep learning, zero-shot and few-shot learning, natural language understanding and generation. Additional info can be found at her personal website. And a little bit more, more of my personal anecdote is that I, I first knew, knew Yana in 2020 in the ACL volunteer program. And, 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 you know, and after the 2020, I've seen uh, Yana doing ma many uh, seminar research including the GPT understands uh, GPT understands too, which is the uh, very first seminar research on continuous training. Yeah, and I'm very looking forward to hearing her newest and uh, latest research today. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you for your introduction. Um, okay, hello everybody. Okay, uh, before I start, actually, I I want to thank Dr. Main, Isong, and Abino for inviting me to share my work here. And uh, today, what I'm going to talk about is revisiting facial learning for natural language understanding. And uh, particularly, I will present facial learning from a more practical perspective, actually, according to some of my experiences and findings. And uh, I have to say that uh, some of the findings could be a little bit aggressive, I think. But in my opinion, it represents a possible perspective and it should be provided for open discussion. So uh, I'm also looking forward to more suggestions and comments on them from all of you, yeah. So uh, next I will present along the following roadmap. So first I will mainly address three key issues that have uh, provoked us to rethink about visual learning, respectively the evaluation protocols, the performance and the robustness. And also I will try to recognize several more aspects ago, uh, which we recently have studied. For example, uh, what are other uh, possible issues remaining to be solved in the area of visual learning? And uh, is it possible to get rid of pre-training while preserving the possible, uh, uh, the, the high performing official performance? Yeah. Um, well, we have seen much progress in the NLP field made by data rich applications, uh, but, uh, but in practice, it often faces a great challenges when there's no sufficient fluid data, right? So facial learning exactly tries to address this problem, which emphasizes quickly learning a new task with very few labeled samples. For example, uh, empirically, there are usually less than 100. And what we are emphasize here is true visual learning instead of, instead of just visual learning. So what are the differences? Uh, so first of all, actually, according to a bunch of previous work, there would be multiple data episodes and each episode can, consisting of dozens of training data and validation, validation data. So there could be even hundreds of or thousands of data for such a visual setting in total. Uh, however, in practice, the dozens of labeled samples are all we have, and we can do anything with and only with a dozens of data. So uh, traditional learning in practice means there's no access of multiple data set episodes, no large validation set, and no visible text data to, to use as a priori, right? So otherwise it could be formulated as a, as a fully, uh, uh, fully supervised learning problem. So this is the basic definition for true visual learning. And only with this definition can our uh, visual methods be truly used in real world scenarios. Uh, and it, it is also noteworthy that uh, actually visual learning for natural language understanding covers a wide range of methods. For example, early works on visual learning are usually based on meta learning or basing method, uh, et cetera. And recent years, 
the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm together with prompting have become the de facto solution to many uh, official NLP problems. So what we are talking about today, mainly based on this type of methods and uh, specifically uh, for prompting, it used, uh, as, the, the, as the figure show, it used such a prompt, which could be as simple as just a pattern that combine multiple pieces of text together with punctuations and to reformulate the, the understanding task into a fill in the blank task. So uh, for example, in this case of a natural language inference, we have a premise as X1 and we have a hypothesis as two. The prediction of yes equals labeling entailment while the no equals not entailment. So under this trivial definition, as well as the prompt-based pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm, we will first address the problem of the evaluation protocol. So the, back, uh, uh, the overall background is that through several preliminary experiments, we were surprised to find that uh, when using different evaluation protocols, the relative performance between different methods have been totally subverted. And actually, um, most existing methods are using totally different evaluation protocols, which have uh, become an obstacle hindering the, the fair comparison between methods on a common ground and mirroring the true progress of the field. So uh, here I'll give two examples as follows. Like uh, some works directly use a fixed configuration. However, uh, they are exposed in, uh, they are very likely to be exposed in the risk of overestimating since the fixed configuration was selected by referring to the test set in the previous experiment, right? So this could be likely to cause information leakage. And while other works use a small data set to perform model selection, however, there are lots of differences in details like uh, how to split out a data set. It will make a huge difference as I will show later. So uh, to sum up, it is believed a convert official evaluation protocol is tested urgently. So to this end, we propose a official evaluation framework. And also we have experimented a number of different business split strategies and use competitive resources to, to justify its advantages of each of them. And many, uh, we will many justify from three aspects, including the test set performance, the correlation between the dev and test sets, as well as the stability. And uh, I think I need to skip details about uh, the framework since uh, I, I want to directly get to some interesting findings based on it. So we shall talk about the details later uh, after the talk, I think. So um, with this evaluation framework, we proceed to reevaluate a number of state of our uh, state of our future methods, and the results reveals several interesting findings. So the first one is that by comparing results with this justified evaluation framework and the results from previous evaluation, we find out that the absolute performance and the relative performance of official uh, official methods were in general not accurately not accurately estimated. And I think this highlights the, the importance of evaluation for uh, obtaining reliable conclusion, right? And uh, the second is that since we have experiment on different pre-trained language models of different scales, uh, one of which is as large as 15 billion in parameter size. So it is also observed that the benefits of some fusion methods decrease on larger pre-trained models, like the 15 billion deep data. Perhaps it reveals that uh, some methods are not capable of scaling to larger scale models. Uh, actually, this is a very severe problem in practice, since it is proved that the official methods generally would further improve when we increase the size of model, according to our general scaling law, right? But it will make no sense when using uh, with such a method be using in the best practice scenarios, it won't work anymore. Yeah. And the third is, uh, since we have mentioned the best practice scenario, 
So we also try to explore in the limit what is the best performance visual learning can achieve. So to do so, we, put, uh, we practically combine various methods and evaluate it under our proposed evaluation uh, framework. So the third finding is that uh, the gains of different methods are complementary and a combination of the methods largely outperform any individual methods. And besides, the combination results even performs close to a very strong physical system uh, 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 achieved by Roberta. Actually, uh, it indicates that uh, with such a combination, it is possible to, to further narrow the gap between the official learning as well as fully supervised learning. If we can do that, it will be very useful in practice, right? And uh, however, another observation is that uh, the combination that have achieved the best performance with different tasks are very different. Uh, it means currently there is no single method that dominates most of the understanding tasks. A method could only uh, benefit a kind of bias to uh, a certain data set. This highlights uh, the need for development of efficient methods with more consistent and robust uh, performance across different tasks. And that's to say it is supposed to, well, for a method, it is supposed to learn the understandability instead of understanding a certain task only, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, we also open source a toolkit based on the evaluation framework and ability to board. And it is, it is believed that there would be more interesting findings to see. So we hope such a toolkit could help benchmarking future learning and uh, expanded that research in this field. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think uh, that's all for the evaluation part. Uh, maybe we, we shall have some Q&A first. Yeah. So any questions about the evaluation part? Yeah, any question about the field NLU? Uh, this paper has uh, uh, also have SAB uh, in the author list, Sebastian Ruder, a very, also a rising star in our field. Uh, any question? Um, Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Hello. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, we, we know that uh, the, the few short uh, evaluation is very unstable, right? Yeah, yeah. So how did you deal with this problem? Oh, yeah, good question. That's a detail within the evaluation framework, right? So uh, first of all, uh, actually, we first try to identify several factors that will cause the, the, uh, the instability problem. For example, there are lots of uh, hyperparameters, uh, including like uh, the batch size, learning rate, also uh, including the randomness, right? So actually we handle both of the factors differently for hyperparameters such as the learning rate and batch size and et cetera. We try to search them over a hyperparameter space to search for the best. And as for the randomness, we try to average over multiple Cs. To, to report a average, average results. That's for when we want to benchmark a method. But actually in practice or in industrial scenario, we usually try to first uh, traverse all possible hyperparameters and find the best. And then we will use the best hyperparameter to, to rerun over the, the entire label data so that, such that it, it achieved the best uh, performance in practice. So, so am I understood? Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, another question is, uh, uh, compared to the evaluation method of meta-learning, uh, uh, your method seems different, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, actually in this work, we do not directly compare with meta-learning. The reason is that uh, usually meta learning problem, it requires lots of uh, similar source tasks, right? And this yeah. is usually hard to get in, in our problem scenario in the, in, the, in the field of NLU, right? And th that's the first difference. And the second is that for meta learning methods, they usually can only handle the, 
the cases with uh, like uh, tons of uh, less than 10 examples. But usually for, for official NIU, there will be dozens of data and which is not capable of uh, being handled by meta learning methods. So, uh, so that's why we do not directly compare them. I think they are suitable for different uh, problem scenarios. Okay. Uh, I, have, I still have a question. Uh, can your framework extend to image vision uh, for vision? I'm, I'm sorry, could you please pardon? Uh, uh, future learning in, in vision, computer vision, can your framework extend to? Uh, uh, no, uh, using that this 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 form framework to test the filter learning in uh, image. Uh, in, in image, right? Yeah, uh, we do yeah. not we do not experiment with image right uh, now. Do you, th do you think it's possible to? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Actually, I don't think they are compatible. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, any other questions, please? Okay, uh, so then I'll just go on. Yeah. So uh, according to the re-evaluation uh, re results, data augmentation is a promising type of methods. However, in many cases, using data augmentation results in very severe instability in performance, and even it will encounter a failure mass, which means it, uh, the performance may drop by a lot or it will show fluctuations severely depending on which pre models or which task is used. So for the BA, uh, exactly mainly address the, the, the problem of robustness uh, from the perspective of data augmentation. And it is motivated by two very simple observations. The first is that uh, during prelim preliminary experiments, we manually try to augment different types of data including the label preserved ones, which is generally shared by previous DA methods, as well as the label flipped ones. And we follow the principle of making minimal changes of the original text. And the results in this table show that augmenting samples with label uh, with, the flip, uh, with the flip labels generally show much better performance than those with preserved labels like this. For example, in this case, um, CB, RT, and AWSC, it shows a performance gap up to 10 points. So uh, it is conjectured that uh, the label flipping augmentation provides useful information about which local parts of the sentence are very important and determine the label, right? Yeah. That's the first, uh, the, the first observation. And the second observation is that when we augment data, there will be lots of noises. So we manually try to fix various types of noises and see how much improvements it will bring. So the results show that uh, even correcting a minor syn syntactic error will bring a large improvements of feature performance. And besides, correcting the labels brings even larger gains, indicating that uh, denoising is very important and it tends to alleviate the robustness issue. So that's the second, that's our second uh, observation. So both of the simple observations motivates us to, to propose flip DA, which is a official methods by data augmentation. So it could generate, it could first generate a label flip data without label preserving assumptions. And it can automatically reduce the noises as much as possible. Uh, so specifically, it mainly consists of, consists of the four steps. So first, it, it will try to train a classifier without any augmented data, which means with the only labeled data. And secondly, it will try to automatically generate both label preserved and label flipped data, augmented data. And the third step is that it will try to use the classifier to, to filter the the example cases, which means filtering the, the noises, right? And then it will use both the original data as well as the generated data to, to retrain, to iteratively, iteratively retrain the classifier. So uh, in this way, the, the official performance 
is improved. So uh, there is one important feature about Flip EA. Unlike other semi-supervised methods that rely heavily on unlabeled data, which are really, really hard to get in practice. So Flip EA get rid of the dependency of unlabeled data while, banning, while still benefiting from the data augmentation. Yeah, so that's a very important feature, which makes it more practical. So our results on, on eight tasks and two base models of different skills show that uh, it can achieve a really good trade-off between the effectiveness and the robustness. And uh, Flip DA substantially improves uh, many tasks while not negatively affecting the, the others. Uh, uh, but, but, but also I have to say that uh, actually the ex experiments are supposed to be extended to an even larger range of tasks uh, and models. But in my opinion, I think these results are representative enough to a large degree since we are using the, the, the super glue benchmark, which consists of multiple complicated tasks. For example, there are lots of sentence triple and sentence, uh, sentence pair tasks. And even for some of them, like uh, the, the natural language like entailment, it is even hard for humans to discriminate. So I think that the, the, the difficulty is, is good enough to, to, to represent the, the results. So that's why we are confident about these results. So here I'll show two representative examples that have been generated by FreeDA. And uh, this is an example of a natural language inference. And the sentence in black are the original ones, and the, the, the sentence in, in, in blue are the augmentative ones. And as we can see in the first case, it adds a not to the premise, and therefore the label flips. And in the second, in the second case, it changed the doing those into increased. So the the, the label changes from not until to until. So we can see that uh, the way of flip the A to change or to keep label is very rich and natural. And it does not happen only for certain cases, but with a very high possibility. So I think that could possibly explain why flip the A achieves both effectiveness and uh, robustness. Yeah. So, uh, Another interesting phenomena, perhaps that can also help could explain why FlipD works, is that uh, we tried data augmentation along different directions. So, what are directions? So, for each task, we try to describe the directions as follows. Like, uh, for example, we have the RTE task, which is a natural language inference task. So, examples with entailment labels could be a little bit harder than those of not entailment, right? Since one need to go over through the entire sentences and ensure there is no any confliction and then decide the entailment label. However, for not entailment cases, one just need to find one confliction from a local information. So it is much more easier. So uh, another example is for, for the BQ task, which is a yes and no uh, question answering task. Examples with yes label could be a little, bit, a little more harder than those with no labels, since one needs every detail information to decide yes, while only partial of the, uh, of the information to decide no. So, so we decide the, 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 the hard and easy labels for, for each task. And then we perform uh, augmentation through different directions, and the results show that augmenting along from the hard to easy direction would benefit more the facial performance. And actually this is somewhat consistent with human intuition. Intuitively, hard examples ask for even higher requirements towards our methods and models. And it is very difficult to understand, right? So at this time, if we could provide a label flipped data for, for comparison, and tell the model which is the, uh, which which is the key parts to to decide a label. It will help a lot. So uh, I think I think this, this this results is quite consistent with our intuition. Yeah. So in this way, uh, there is something similar 
to, to contrast to learning because they both work by comparing two things, but actually they, they, they totally share different goals. Yeah. Oh, so, so that's our first solution that tries to address the problem that a few NLU has proposed is just by, by the augmentation. So I think we can just skip and uh, have a question and answer. Yeah, I must. I myself have a question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so, so my question is a very a naive one. So, what do you mean by hard, and what do you mean by easy? So, when you are talking about hard, you mean it is intrinsically hard. For example, it requires complex reasoning that you need to combine different uh, spans and attacks to reach the conclusion, or just this type of samples are few. And you know, neural network requires a, a mm -hmm. huge amount of data to train. So, what do you mean by hard? Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, my my question is: you mean hard tasks or hard labels? Uh, where I just mean, you know, you have the directions here: hard to easy uh, yeah. and easy to yeah. hard. So, what do you mean by hard or easy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think this is a very very good question since the definition for hard and easy is quite subjective. But and uh, I can only exp explain uh, in my way, <laughs> uh, like uh, for the RTE task, uh, for a example with entailment, if, you wa if, we, if we wanna decide the label entailment, we need to go over through every detail of the sentences. So uh, it requires more efforts. However, if we wanna decide in not, not entail, we can only try to find one, uh, one contradiction from local information. So this is just an intuitive description, but uh, I cannot prove it. <laughs> okay, 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 yeah. cool enough, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I have to say this, this slide is a post hoc analysis. <clears throat> okay. Okay. It, it perhaps provides some, uh, sorry, <clears throat> it perhaps, okay. Yeah, provide us some, some, yeah, some, some intuition of how to understand the model, but uh, I don't think it is quantitatively. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good enough. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, okay. Thanks, Yana. I have one question relevant yeah. to the song. Uh, why do you think the hard to use direction is from the no to yes? Uh, in my understanding, I think the answer no is more easy than the yes. Because if you want to answer the no, uh, you, you just uh, uh, skip the whole passage, and you want to answer the yes, you you may want you may sure to uh, find uh, elements to support this uh, answer. So uh, my question is, why why the direction from no to yes is a hard to easy direction? Oh, I like your explanation. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. About about the book you task. Uh, actually, I I I'll just explain as I have explained on the RTE task. If we wanna decide yes, and we need to check every information within the whole passage and the questions. And uh, if we want to decide no, we just uh, uh, give one information that conflicts the the passage. Yeah, so uh, again, I cannot uh, prove it. Uh, it's just a intuitive explanation according to the results obtained. I think this is a disadvantage and remains to, to be further analyzed, analyzed in, in the future. Yeah, okay. uh, I also agree with your explanation in terms of the yes and no, actually. But currently there, is, there, there are some complication and we don't know why. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, thank you so much. So, any other questions? Hi. Okay. So, so, so I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Please. So, so, so this this work is based on the prompt tuning paradigm. Uh, yeah, prompt based fine tuning, but we use the manual prompt. The manual discrete prompts. Yeah. Okay. You only evaluate on the prompt tuning. Yeah, right. Uh, 
you mean you mean we need to we need also use the standard fine tuning, right? Um, maybe I don't know. Mm. Uh, yes, this is a very good question, and it will be more complete. Uh, since in previous work we have uh, provided evidence that uh, prompt based fine tuning for few shot consistently perform better than the uh, the standard fine tuning. So uh, since we have such a conclusion, we do not uh, perform standard fine tuning on data augmentation. Okay. But this yeah, but this conclusion does not always right for fully supervised learning, but it it always keeps according to my experience, uh, efficient learning, yeah. Uh, so your method can also, could add, also be applied to a normal future learning? Uh, you mean right. standard fine tune? Sure, of, of course, it's just the performance are not as well as such a setting. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. You're welcome. So any other questions? Okay, uh, let's just go on. So uh, in addition to improve visual performance and robustness from the perspective of data augmentation, we also consider to improve the visual performance from the perspective of prompts. Yeah, so at the beginning, we have introduced how prompting works with the textual entailment task and show uh, pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm together with the prompting has achieved the, the de facto performance for visual, visual learning. Uh, however, at this table, table shows that we find discrete patterns suffers from really high instability, which could be a key source for causing the robustness problem, right? So uh, actually, this is a case of lemma knowledge problem. And when it comes to the facial scenario, this instability could be even more severe due to the sensitive nature of the facial learning. For example, uh, by comparing the last two lines, the last two lines, there's only one difference of a word in, and uh, it leads to a performance drop by 20 points. So the, the instability is very severe. So that's why we think prompts are a very important perspective of addressing visual performance and robustness. So we propose a uh, PTOE, which employs trainable continuous prompts uh, into uh, in, com in combination of the discrete prompts. So specifically, uh, given a actually here give, given a, a a set of discrete prompt tokens, and we will combine the continuous prompt tokens into it, and they are together be input into the pre-trained language models, and the continuous prompt tokens are updated by backpropagation to optimize the task objective. Uh, so an intuition. Uh, that is, continuous prompts incorporates a certain degree of vulnerability into the inputs. So it might uh, learn to offset the effects of minor changes in discrete prompts to improve the, the training uh, instability. So that's, I, uh, that's, uh, that's possibly why p works. So we particularly experimented on, on the future learning pro uh, problem and the results are uh, as table five shows. And we find that p consistently outperform PT. PT is a, a typical manual discrete prompt method and it outperforms it on average by, by more, more than one point. And it proved that by automatically learning continuous prompt tokens, the pre-trained models can achieve better visual performance on the understanding task. And uh, Possibly uh, p tuning such as prompts within a continuous space, right? So it makes it possible to select the high performing prompts beyond the vocabulary and the pre trained models can express. That's to say, uh, there could be prompts within certain continuous embeddings, but the embedding cannot be mapped into the discrete world. Yeah. So I think they are they are trying to search in such prompts as and they improve the performance. And uh, here are results to demonstrate that p tuning also stabilizes the the language model adaptation, which means uh, it reduces the differences the differences between different patterns. And uh, uh, at the, at the table show that 
the manual prompts have a very large impact on the performance, like uh, uh, number five is the, 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 the worst performing one. However, with p uh, the, the gap between different patterns are narrowed down. Yeah. So we say uh, p tuning perhaps can increase the stability with, the, with respect to the, the patterns. So it's more robust, robust to the choice of patterns. And the, besides, it is also interesting to find out uh, how to combine continuous prompt tokens, including where to insert, how to insert, and how many tokens to, to insert. Actually, we, we did such a comprehensive study. And uh, here are several findings. Like uh, the first is, it will be better if we insert com continuous prompts at the location where it does not segment the sentences. For example, in the first part, in the first pattern, uh, the prompt tokens actually break the completeness of this sentence. While in this one also complete, uh, break the completeness of this sentence. However, for the third one, the prompt tokens uh, locate be between sentences. So it does not break the completeness. So I will find such a strategy would be better. That's the first finding. So secondly, by for example, number two and number four, we also find that there is no special preference for placing the tokens on the edge or in the middle. So it is suggested to write a number of pattern candidates and then search for them. And the third is about the number. And uh, we do have observed that the number of prompt tokens affects a lot on the facial learning. However, it is not that a larger number of uh, prompt tokens will be, always be better. No. We can gesture uh, that it will be due to the limited training data. It becomes more difficult to train the parameters when excessively increasing the number of continuous prompts. So in practice, we also need to search for the appropriate number of uh, prompt tokens. Yeah. Oh, that's for the GP understand the P tuning. So uh, shall we take a break and uh, have a question and answer session? Yeah, uh, maybe Taha yeah. has a question. Because oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, Yan, and thanks for the uh, speech. So, yeah, I think one question, uh, it's already been quite long since I read the paper, so I was going through my notes uh, while you were uh, giving your speech. So I think one thing I had in mind was, so for the pseudo prompts uh, that you uh, replace within the input, right? Are you, uh, do you have an initialization strategy or are they just randomly initialized? Yeah, uh, the, prop, the pseudo tokens are totally randomly uh, initialized. So uh, have, you, have you ever considered initializing them with maybe like uh, the, the, the task itself? Like, you know, for the, for the example you gave in the paper, it's the discrete prompt search starts with the capital of Britain is mask, right? So uh, what do you think would happen if you start the initialization with those words and uh, only after that try to find? Oh, uh, actually we have several experiments by in initializing the, the pseudo token with a mm. certain meaningful embedding. Mm. And we find uh, sometimes it will bring a improvement comparing this version. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but as as I have seen, I have said that uh, actually we 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 want the the pseudo token, the pseudo token to to search for an embedding that locate in the middle of the continuous space, and perhaps it cannot be mapped into the display space. So oh, I see. So you yeah, don't so want far. to, yeah. Uh, yeah, want to try more. I see. I see. Yeah. To so, so, mm, uh, but there is another problem is about the optimization. It is not always to find such a optim such a ideal ideal continuous embeddings. So if not initialize it with uh, a existing embedding is a better choice in practice. Mm. So it converges uh, more frequently, yeah. is it? I see. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess another question would be. So for the prompt encoder, I know you didn't mention the insights of it, but uh, I think in the paper, uh, you, you explained that it is an LSTM based uh, mechanism, right? 
I wonder yeah. why did you choose LSTM, right? So rather than maybe like a, I don't know, a self-attention kind of um, uh, layer, yeah. Oh, oh uh, yeah, about the choice of PROM encoder, right? Uh, actually, uh, recently we have several more application study on the choice of uh, PROM encoder. Mm -hmm. We have tried three versions, including the LSTM, mm -hmm. the MLP, which has been used in previous continuous prompts based uh, mm -hmm. works, yeah. And the third is uh, just the embedding. We do not use any other parameters and we mm -hmm. just uh, directly optimize the embedding. Yeah, so the three version we found that uh, generally both L uh, LSTM and L MLP works generally well on most of the tasks. So uh, it, it has certain differences uh, yeah. according to different tasks. Yeah, but the directly optimizing the embedding is not uh, a performance a little bit worse than both of them. So yeah. in our new version, we will recommend them to use both uh, LSTM or MLP. Yeah. So um, yeah. the motivation behind the LSTM is to have some kind of temporary relation between the pseudo tokens, right? So I was yeah. wondering if attention mechanism makes sense to use here. What do you think? Is it, is it a viable strategy to use self-attention here or uh, it doesn't make sense? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, I can so, you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, um, actually, if, for instead of using LSTM here, right? We can yeah. uh, have uh, position tokens uh, for pseudo prompts and uh, just replace it with a self-attention mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. And okay, oh, yeah, I, I I actually have been experimenting uh, a few uh, with this, and I kind of get good results. So I was wondering if you ever considered uh, using the self-attention. Uh, uh, that's a some attention, right? Yeah. No, I, I did not experiment on such mm. a version, but mm -hmm. but I think it, sh yeah, uh, it, it should be. Uh, we should <laughs> we should explain according to the the results, but, but intuitively, I think yeah. it would work better. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because yeah. the ACR results show that. Yeah, kind of. But I was I I want to make sure to like to get your perspective as well if you ever thought about it. But yeah. If you oh. think it's also intuitive, I guess yeah, I should oh, I should go. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> we can talk more about it. yeah. Thanks, thanks for the new explanation. Oh, thank you. So, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, actually, after introduce P P P P P P actually, the, the at last I'm gonna try to identify several more aspects to go. Uh, uh, some of the work we have recently studied. So, uh, the first uh, from from the first back, from the first back uh, for, for first aspects. Uh, actually, we want to try to identify some of more key issues <coughs> following up the the work before. For example, for example, within the evaluation framework, in addition to uh, determine uh, how to split out the the, the depth, depth, depth set. Actually, there is another valuable question to answer is how to decide the hyperparameter space, right? Since we are doing a great searching and we find the decide of the, the decision of uh, hyperparameter space quite affect a lot. That's a problem that remains to be solved. And another problem is that um, about flip DA, since it does not incorporate any unable data. The generate data are generally lack of diversity. And uh, uh, we have observed that in a way, the, the overall feature performance is, is, is affected by multiple coupled factors, like the number of data, the, the data quality, the data diversity, and the label distribu the distribu distribution, distribution, et cetera. So uh, in different cases, it is possible that either of the factors could dominate the, 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 the final performance. So to make such a method effective, it is very important to, to make sure that other factors should not become a bottleneck. Yeah. And a third, with PGNI, uh, it is possible to perform parameter efficient learning, which means uh, by updating only very few set of parameters, it can achieve a really good performance on different generalized data. And that's, uh, what I want to say. And another problem, which I'm really, really interested in, is that uh, 
is it possible to get a rid of pre-training from scratch? And uh, in my opinion, I, I think it is possibly yes. Uh, actually, uh, recently we have a uh, we have a work to trying to answer this question uh, since it currently focused on the general supervised learning and did not achieve any results on visual learning. So I did not include it into the main talk of this of this share. So. Uh, uh, here, I think I'll just briefly introduce a general ideas about it. So uh, the motivation is like this. Uh, we find it is a very interesting phenomenon that humans are able to quickly master a certain task with very limited time and efforts. Uh, since they, they can only focus on certain pieces of information and relevant information, so, for example, when the students come for 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 exams, they re they only review very few chapters of the book instead of all the books in the world, right? So, following this observation, we conjecture that uh, one of the key aspects of learning a task is to quickly and precisely locate the task relevant information. Uh, so, so we try to develop such a framework named the TLM. And uh, it first automatically retrieve the relevant training data from a, a general corpus and then learn on the retrieved data and uh, task data together. Yeah. So this is a comparison of the features between TLM and pre training. And we can see that uh, TLM can achieve results better than or even similar to, to pre training models while reducing the training flux by two orders, two orders of magnitude. So that's to say, with only 1% of data and 1% of training, training cost, TLM can achieve similar performance as pre-training. Yeah, so that's why we think it is very promising. And uh, with such a high accuracy and efficiency, we also hope TLM will contribute to uh, democratizing LP in the future. Uh, also, currently it has lots of, uh, it has some disadvantages like uh, I cannot generalize to more tasks, but I think such a problems could be solved in the near future, I think. Yeah. So uh, that's all for today. And I'm also looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Okay, uh, please join me and thank Yana for this wonderful talk. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Questions? No? Yeah. yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Well, I think I've, we still have 10 minutes for you know general QA. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Yeah. I have one question uh, for the last slide, actually. Yeah. So I think it is quite impressive that TLM actually does better. But this kind of brings up the question. So if, uh, if, if TLM does better in this case, does this mean that the standard pre-training on the uh, on the larger corpus does not actually benefit uh, on on this specific case to the like end task right because uh, so the, in in my understanding the uh, the motivation behind pre-training is that your your model has some uh, larger sense of uh, the language and you know it, it helps it better generalize to, uh, to the end task but if TLM does better, uh, does it is it really true you know yeah uh, i think this is yeah i think this is a very good question and uh okay okay first of all i think this uh both tlm and uh, pre-training should be used in different scenarios for example industrial sometimes we have one product mm. and we need to provide the same service a service to different clients so mm -hmm. in this way, we need to perform very similar tasks multiple times, even thousands, thousands of times. So in this way, pre-training a, a, a model is very, it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but sometimes in research, we sometimes only need to re uh, study one task or several tasks. And in this time, pre-training a model is very costly. And uh, yeah. So in this time, using TLM can, can save lots of time and computing, computational uh, resources mm -hmm. and uh, quickly achieve the, the goal of studying 
of studying the, the specific tasks. Yeah, I think both of them have their pros and cons, at least for the current world of TLM. So what, what is the con for TLM? If it, like, if it actually achieves better results at the end task, I, I can't not see a con, oh. right? Because it's both cheaper and better, so. Yeah, you mean, you mean, you mean why TLM can work, right? Uh, I think I can explain like this. Uh, actually, when we use large uh, general corpus to pre-train model, actually there are lots of redundancy within the data. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, not all of the data are are, mm, are efficient. Yeah. So on the one hand, we are trying to remove all the all the redundancy by, yeah. by selecting data. That's the first perspective. And the second is that since TLM is task driven, mm. it's, uh, not we not only remove the redundancy, we also remove some uh, uh, data related to other tasks. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, we are trading off generality for efficiency. I see. Yeah. I see. So that's how it works. I see. Yeah. So then you you probably don't have any solution for the zero shot case, for example, right? Uh, I, actually, that's the, the, the next the next step. Go. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see. <laughs> I, I like your reading. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the answer. So, please, any other questions? Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks for the good talk. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, so, I uh, I have a, a maybe more general question. So in, in practice, we often see that we have both a pretty large domain mismatch as well as little data. Uh, so, so in industry practice, um, you have a project or a task that you wanna solve. It is not exactly, I mean, it's often similar, like it's text classification, right? But it's not exactly like uh, news group 20. Um, so, and, and the data is often small. So we have both a big domain mismatch, let's say customer service support. Uh, and you have uh, very limited data. Um, do you have a maybe a recommendation, a recommendation in practice which approaches um, uh, could be most helpful in such a situation from your experience? Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I cannot catch you. I'm so sorry. So, Ethan, could you please help me? Yeah, I mean, uh, could you please then you uh, <laughs> okay? I'll repeat it. Uh, so, so what are the best approaches uh, if you have both uh, little label data and uh, also a big domain mismatch? So, um, a very different task mm -hmm. from the typical NLP tasks. Yeah. Uh, so, my first question is: You mean a domain mismatch? It means they are both classification tasks, but uh, varying domain or they are just like a generation task instead of a classification task. No, I, uh, let, let's say both are, maybe, maybe we stay with classification, uh, but a very different domain. Uh, okay. So for example, financial documents or um, product support or um, customer master data. Uh, I mean, not, not the typical news yeah. group data or news wire data uh, that we typically have. Mm, yeah. Uh... So, so uh, I, I actually, uh, I have a, I have one experience to share with you, is that we have uh, we have several biomedical data actually, and uh, there are only like a dozen of pieces data, and we try to classify them into into different uh, diseases. So, uh, according to our experiences, we try to directly run. They, the, the data over uh, like PET, uh, yeah, we find uh, it is much more easier for such a data to, to achieve a very high, high accuracy since they are more likely to overfitting on the data set. And the test, the test set is more, is more like, is likely to be more similar to the, the training set. Mm -hmm. So they are not, they are dispersed in, in, in diversity so uh, so so uh, that's uh, that's my ex experiences and I, I will try to uh, starting from the PET method and trying to to have an initial results first because PET is the most stable methods as far as I know for efficient learning yeah based on this uh, this results and then I may try to try other techniques like uh, adding uh, recognition or augmenting more data.
So I don't okay. know whether this can help you. So uh, we should try it out. I mean, in uh, we have used various and or we have various NLP things in practice that we build, and uh, we do use in some cases uh, large language models like BERT. Uh, we see a little bit of improvement, but not tremendous often. And I think a reason could be this domain mismatch. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for the advice. Maybe we should okay. have a look. You, you mean using such a method does not outperform uh, like, like um, So I don't think we have used these future learning yeah. approaches yet. So I think this is something we should look into um, from using pre-trained models and then fine tuning them. We see a little bit of improvement, um, but often not tremendous improvement. Okay. Oh. Yeah, Daniel. That yeah, Daniel. I mean, you can uh, chat with Yana offline if she doesn't fully answer your question. And I have. No, I think this was helpful. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have dropped her uh, uh, email uh, to you th through the channel. Can you see her email? I just. I can see it. Yes. Send send to the chat. Cool. Yeah. It's my pleasure to to share all of this with you, and I'm really interested in your work as well. So please feel free to to contact me. Yeah, thank you. So I just dropped the email there. Any more questions from audience? Um, hey, hello. Hi. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, your two work of Leap DA and uh, P tuning is based on from tuning, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, do you test uh, the stability of the paradigm of tuning? Uh, you mean did I uh, experiment that stability, right? Yes. Oh, actually, it's, uh, uh, it's a more stable or not? Oh, yeah, it, it's a very good question. So first of all, in terms of flip DA, uh, actually in this work we try to define robustness like this. Uh, whether flip DA increase the performance on all the tasks and on both models. And actually, we found that the, the, the results in both the results that uh, show the improvements. So uh, I think this is the the, the sign for the robustness of the uh, I, I don't know whether this is the stability that you refer to. Or oh, maybe. Oh, I see. Yeah. You and test uh, multiple render states and get yeah. a result. OK. Yeah, and in terms of p-tuning, uh, actually we, we we only focus on, on the stability in terms of uh, different patterns currently. Also, we have tried to report the, the standard deviation for each results. Uh, I know I have to say this is not that direct uh, to describe the instability. Uh, so maybe in the future, I will try to be uh, figure ex more, be more be more explicit in terms of uh, stability. Yeah. Okay. That's, uh, that's the, the work of flip flip DA is you using manual template, right? Uh. uh such a what? Manual uh, template. Yes. 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 Uh, we so, use manual templates. So did you test? Uh, oh, I don't know. I don't know if you test the. Uh, okay. You mean the automatically learn the prompts? Uh, I don't. Uh, I. I know in the tem if the template is different, and it it also cause the instability, right? Yeah, so it will make a difference. I, I'm wondering if the flip DA method could enhance the stability of the uh, of different templates. Oh, uh, very good question. Uh, actually, in this work, uh, we, we, we mainly focus on uh, examining the digital augmentation. So we fix the, the templates. But actually, some of, some of our preliminary experiments show different templates will lead to different results. And uh, uh, a template should come along with the model, actually. For example, we have uh, experiment with Albert, with Deberta, with Deberta. Actually, both of the models share different fast patterns, and there could be certain overlap, but generally they are different. So currently, we when performing this work, we are trying to use the empirically best patterns now. 
So how do you choose the template? Is the template the same for all the baselines and uh, your model? Uh, yeah, yeah. For the baseline, we also use the same best perform pattern. And uh, in terms of uh, in terms of how we choose the best pattern, we just uh, run several prelimin preliminary experiments uh, using PET and then see the results. So you you know the work of uh, Dan Chi Chen, right? Yeah. You you, you mean your, LMBFF, so, right? Yes. Uh, do you uh, follow the the method to find the templates? Yeah. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, actually, uh, we have a small. Uh, I'm sorry. Today I did not show it in the slides. We have a uh, ablation study in the P2 work. We try to compare with the LMBFF, and we find uh, our work uh, combined with the the, the search the searched best prompt patterns. P tuning can can further improve the the performance to a certain degree. So I think they are they can combine together and work well. Since B, uh, LMBFF is automatically search discrete prompts, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they, they can be combined together with the tuning. And also I think it is a really good suggestion that you give me that I can use the method to select the best pattern and then to perform flip DA. You mean that? Okay. Okay. Uh, because I know it's very difficult to choose a uh, good template. Yeah. Uh, why is it difficult? You just uh, run. It's... Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. Please, why is it difficult? Uh, because I I I seen a paper of on the Dan Chi Chen and it's uh, it causes um, many it uh, depends on the template for the performance. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chen Yu. Uh, any other okay. questions from other uh uh, uh listeners? Yeah. Okay, perhaps time is up. Uh, so maybe we can end here. And so please join me and thank Yana again for this very wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. And okay, so 